I want you to take your Bibles today and turn with me to a familiar Old Testament story. Turn to Genesis chapter 22. And I want to read in your hearing verses 1 through 13. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 13. I'm reading from the New King James Bible. If you found it, might you indicate as such by saying amen. Indulge with me if you don't mind. Stand with me as I read the word of God. I told the church the other, the other service, there's nothing necessarily spiritual about standing when the Bible is read. Uh, if nothing else, it gets the blood running a little bit warmer in your veins. And I'm guaranteed that whatever happens today, I can go back and say I stood them up. I had them on their feet. <laughs> Here's how my Bible reads. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, the lad, and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb, a lamb for the burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out uh, his hand uh, and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. But now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a, in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Verse 1 for emphasis. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. Will you look at your neighbor, smile at him or her, and tell him or her, it's only a test. That's what I want to talk about. You may be seated. It's only a test. Periodically, when watching television, the emergency broadcast system will, uh, will alert the public through a long tone or beeping sound. This is done at regular intervals in, so that in case there is a national catastrophe or a national threat to our security, the general public would be informed as to what steps we should take. The announcer begins the announcement by saying, this is a test. For the next 60 seconds, the sound that you will hear will be a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. Now, what he's saying in layman's terminology is, we are not in any real threat or danger. We are not under attack. No, but this is just a test. So that if we were in real danger, we would all be informed as to what steps we should take. So don't panic. Don't throw in the towel. The world is not coming to an end because it's only a test. You know, friends, periodically in life, you and I face those testing moments 
of difficulty and struggle, when it seems that our problems beset us, when trials are on every hand, when our burdens seem almost too heavy to bear. And in those moments, sometimes if we're honest about it, we panic and we attempt it to throw in the towel and to give up and say, our world and life around us must be coming to an end. But the Lord sent me by this morning as one of heaven's emergency broadcast system announcers to tell you, don't panic. Don't throw in the towel. The world is not coming to an end because what you are going through is only a test. Perhaps no one better portrayed this truth than did one of the great patriarchs of biblical history by the name of Abraham. Abraham got off to a rather late start in his relationship with God because by the time God had called and commissioned to him, he was already some 75 years old. And God, remember, had promised Abraham and his wife Sarah that he was going to bless them to have an offspring. And after waiting on God uh, to make good on his promise for almost 25 years, God finally blessed a 100-year-old Abraham and his 90-year-old wife Sarah with a son, and they named him Isaac. And I'm sure that Abraham must have been a proud parent, and he must have been a proud father. And I'm sure that he must have loved all of his children, but there was something special about young Isaac because not only was Isaac his son of his old age, but more importantly, he was his son of promise. I suggest to you that everything was going quite well in Abraham's life and Sarah's life. I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better life than the life old man Abraham was living. He had a relationship with God that was impeccable. He had a loving and devoted wife. He had a son that would carry on the family's name and heritage. He had an abundance of material goods, and he had servants who waited on his every beckoning call. I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better life than the life old man Abraham was living. But one day, and without any warning whatsoever, God came to Abraham and told him to do the unthinkable. God told Abraham to take his son Isaac to the land of Moriah and kill him on an altar and offer him up as a sacrifice unto God. It was from that moment on that Abraham was ushered into the classroom of life and given the greatest test of his faith that he'd ever faced. And I submit to you that when we look closely at Abraham's test of faith, I think we can glean some practical principles that can help each of us when we face our testing times in life as well. So how would I get at this? I guess I'll get at this passage from an interrogative perspective. I really just want to ask three relevant questions of this passage. I'll make some comments and then I'll take my seat. I think, I think the first question that begs an answer uh, when we look at this test that Abraham faced is what was the source of the test? That's a really good place to start by asking who is it or what is it that causes you and me to face testing times of difficulty and struggle in life. Who or what is the source of our tests? Well, to be honest with you, there are at least three choices, some, uh, uh, three sources. First of all, sometimes self is the source. Yeah, sometimes we bring testing moments of difficulty and struggle upon ourselves. Why? Because of the choices and decisions that we make in life. Sometimes we bring hardship on ourselves. Am I talking to somebody you just had to get married? You were in a hurry to get married. You said, I'm going to marry me some him, and I'm going to marry me some her, and I don't care if I'm in or out of the will of God. I'm going to get married, and what started out as Little House on the Prairie soon became Nightmare on Elm Street. You brought it on yourself. We blame the devil for a lot of stuff, don't we? Do we not? So if you're a diabetic, don't say the devil is attacking my health when you drink five sugary sodas and eat a dozen of donuts a day. Sometimes self is the source. Sometimes we bring testing moments of difficulty upon ourselves. But wait a minute. Sometimes Satan is the source. 
You know, sometimes the Lord allows the devil to bring a set of evil circumstances into our lives that we don't like, that we don't want, and that we don't uh, completely understand. Just like he did in the case of Job, remember? God permitted the devil to bring evil into Job's life. Remember, God even goaded the devil. Have you considered my servant Job? Well, I thought about Job, God, but anybody would serve you if you blessed him like you blessed Job. I mean, I thought about it, but I tell you what, if you let me get at Job's stuff, you got that hedge around Job, but I dare you to move that hedge in and allow me to get after Job's stuff, and I'll show you what Job is made of. I'll cause him to initiate a profound, a profane dialogue. I'll cause him to curse you to your face. The devil was under the misguided assumption that Job served God only for God's stuff, but what God understood is that Job had a relationship with God. Ah, and so the devil got after Job, remember, and, and attacked his health, attacked, took all of his land and his livestock, and then t caused all ten of his children to be tragically killed at one time. But worst of all, he lost the confidence of his wife, who said, why don't you still serving God? Why don't you curse God and die? He said, woman, you're talking foolishly. How did Job answer? Job says, here's my answer. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, anybody can bless God when the Lord gives. But can you bless God when the Lord taketh away? You see, friends, you see, um, uh, sometimes God allows the enemy to bring evil circumstances into our lives. But the good news and the silver lining of Job's story for me is that it seems to suggest that the devil does not have fr free reign in the life of a child of God, that the only way he can bring anything into your life is he has to first get permission from God. I grew up uh, in my neighborhood. They had some of these bad, vicious dogs. I mean, these dogs, they, they practiced a non-discrimination policy. They would bite anybody. They didn't care who you were. And sometimes uh, I, because I lived in the neighborhood, I, I would walk by, by those dogs and they would growl at you and hiss and bark and charge after you. And people that, had, you know, were not from the, the neighborhood, they, they, they'd take off running. And I'd stand there, you know, just w casually walk by them. Somebody said, man, don't you know these dogs will bite you? Don't you know they're vicious? Yes, I know these dogs are vicious. And yes, I know they'll bite. But you see, I, 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 I live here and I recognize that these dogs have a leash around their necks, and I know how long the chain is. <laughs> Can I tell you today, God has a leash around the devil's neck. And he can only go as far in your life as God will permit him. And whatever happens in the life of a child of God is either God sent or God permitted. And if God sends it or if God permits it, he must have a divine purpose for it. Sometimes self is a source. Sometimes Satan is the source. But wait, sometimes God is the source. Now, I've backed myself into the text. Now, it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. Now, the old King James, the old authorized Bible, it, 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 it has a translation that's a little different. It says God tempted Abraham. That's a little misleading because it makes it seem as if God was tempting Abraham to do something that was wrong. And if that, that, that would be a violation of God's own nature and a violation of God's own word because James said, let no man say, when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and is enticed. No, God does not tempt us to do wrong. But God, who is sovereign, has the sovereign right to, to test our faith and to test our loyalty and to test our commitment, even as he did in the case of his only begotten son, Jesus. Uh, when Jesus uh, said to the Lord, in, uh, knowing that Calvary was in front of him, Lord, this is a bitter cup. And if there's any other way for you to accomplish this without me having to go to this cross, I wish you would do it. Nevertheless, not my will 
but your will be done. Sometimes the testing moments that you and I face in life is not something self-inflicted. Sometimes it's not because the devil is attacking you. Sometimes it's because God is allowing it to happen. And I know some of you say, well, that messes up my theology. Why would God allow certain things to happen in my life? It's because God is sovereign. That means he can do what he wants, when he wants, to whom he wants, through whom he wants, whenever he gets ready, and he doesn't owe anybody an explanation. And you can get mad at God, stump, holler, spit at God, shake your fist in the face of God, but guess what? When your makeup runs dry up, he's still going to be God. And the reason he's still going to be God, because he's always been God. He didn't run for the office. Nobody voted him in, and can't anyone vote God out. Moses said from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. He's God when mama dies. He's God when child dies. He's God when you get a pink slip from your job. He's God when you find out it's cancer. But wait, I got to ask a second question. Now that we know something about the source of our testing times of difficulty, but why are we tested? Why? Why, why does God allow us to be tested in life? You know, one of the problems that humankind has is dealing with the whys of life and, more importantly, the whys of God. Come here. May I ask you a question? Have you ever asked God why? Oh, I know you're getting quiet here because you, as you readjust your halo, you don't want your neighbor sitting next to you to know that you have had those frustrating moments when you've asked God why. But for the rest of us human um, mere mortals, I want to remind you today that if you've ever asked God why, you're in good company. Because even Jesus asked God why. There he is on the cross. And when he sensed that he was separated from his father, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yes, friends, all of us will come to those moments when you ask God why. A loved one died and you weren't ready for them to die. I know you love God. But if you're honest about it, it makes you tempted to ask God, Lord, why? You go to the doctor for a regular checkup, and the doctor discovers it's cancer. You know, the dreaded C word. And you will always live with this mentality. You know, that not, that's something that happens to the other folk, not me. I know you love God. But when you get that kind of news, you're tempted to say, Lord, why me? You give your tithe every time you get paid. <laughs> and yet, you always seem to be struggling to keep your head above financial water. And there always seems to be too much month left at the end of your check. <laughs> and you wonder, Lord, where are those windows of heaven? Lord, why? You try to live obediently? No, not all of us. None of us are perfect, and we, we're going to all fall short of God's glory, and we're going to miss God's mark, but at least you're trying to live right. The more you try to be obedient, the more you struggle in life. But there's a joker down the street who goes to nobody's church, and he doesn't seem to have a care in the world. You find yourself saying, Lord, Why? Well, let me suggest to you that perhaps God allows us to be tested. The, the question is still before the house. Why? Why are we tested? I think it's to, to reveal uh, our faith, to reveal how strong our faith really is. Well, you see, you see, um, 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 uh, ver, 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 verse 2, verse 2, uh, uh, God is speaking. Um, Abraham, yes, yes, Lord. Hey, hey, do, you, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Uh, do you love me more than you love anyone and uh, anything? Yes, Lord. Do you love me more uh, than you love that boy Isaac of yours whom you love so much? Of course, Lord. Good. Take him to the land of Moriah. Kill him on an altar. Offer him up as a sacrifice to me. Verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning to go do what God said do. That went right over our head. Let me rewind this. Verse 2. 
Uh, hey, Abraham, yes, Lord, do you love me? Yes, Lord, do you love me more than you love anything and anyone? Yes, Lord, do you love me more than you love that boy Isaac of yours that you waited on so long to get? Yes, Lord, good, take him to the land of Moriah, kill him on an altar, and offer him up as a sacrifice to me. Verse 3, and Abraham rose up early in the morning to go do what God says do. Now, the thing that blows my mind about this text is not what the text says, but what blows my mind is what the text does not say. The text does not say that Abraham Abraham asked God, why? Come here. If there were ever an appropriate time to ask God why, this is one of them. God told Abraham, go kill your child. And Abraham doesn't even ask God why. Listen, if God asks you to kill your no, well. <laughs> if God asks you to kill your child, don't you think? That this um, is an appropriate time to ask God why? I mean, think about it. Abraham is under religious pressure. I mean, perhaps he had been bragging about how, you know, living in a culture where uh, some uh, pagan gods required child sacrifice. Maybe Abraham had, had bragged about Jehovah. Yahweh would never uh, stoop so low as to ask us to kill our children. And now people in the community would say, you said your God, Yahweh, was better than ours. But look at your God. He's now asking you to kill your child. Not only the religious pressure. <laughs> you ever thought about the domestic pressure? Abraham would have been under had he gone home without that boy. Let me see if I can make it make it live. Hey, 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 Sarah, I'm home. Oh, good to have you home, baby. How was your day? Well, it was kind of an eventful day. Well, what, what, what's what's the matter? It's about Isaac. What's the matter? What, what, what's going on? He's 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 dead. He's what? What happened to our child? Did some wild animal, some predator attack our child and kill our child? No. Did, did some bandit rob you along the way and take our child's life? No. What happened? I killed him. You what? Why did you kill him? God told me to. Can you imagine how Abraham was ducking while pots and pans were been flying through the kitchen that day? Why are we testing? I think it's to reveal our faith. You see, it was as if God were pushing Abraham's faith and stretching Abraham's faith and bending Abraham's faith almost to the point of breaking. Sometimes our sovereign God seems to push our faith and stretch our faith and bend our faith almost to the point of breaking. Um, I've been pastoring for a long time. I've been my fifth church pastoring 42 years, preaching 47 years. That's all I've done my whole life. Let's preach. And I remember at my first church there in Little Rock, my first church, St. Mark Baptist Church. I was in my early 20s, and I started having chest pains. I said, wait a minute, I'm too young to have chest pains. I'm not supposed to be having chest pains in my 20s. So I went to the doctor. I said, Doc, man, you got to check me out, man. I'm too young for this. I'm having chest pains. He said, all right, uh, Pastor, we got to test your heart. They're gonna, I'm going to have to give you what they call a stress test. They hook these wires up to your chest, and you get on this tread little like machine. He turns the knob, and I'm walking on it. I said, come on, Doc, man. You can't break me like this. I mean, I can do this all day long. I'm in my early 20s. The Doc turned the knob. The incline got a little steeper. But I'm in a light little, little faster pace, but I'm in my early 20s. Come on, man. I can do this. All, this is what I do. He turned the knob again. Got Steeper, it's going a little faster, but I'm still, I can't let him break me because I'm in my early 20s. My manhood is on the line. Man, you can't break me. Like He turned that knob, incline got steep, belt going fast. I'm in a good little trot. The monkey jumped on my back. I ran out of gas. I said, Doc, man, stop this thing, man. You're trying to kill me. He said, Pastor, the purpose of a stress test is not to induce a heart attack and kill you, but I got to put some pressure on your heart so I can determine how strong your heart is really is. 
Come here, let me tell you something. You will never know how strong your faith is until your faith has been put to the test. It's easy to have faith when you got plenty of money in the bank and two or three cars in the driveway and everybody is healthy. But the real test of your faith is when the bottom of your life falls out and the doctor tells you it's cancer and you get a pink slip on your job or a loved one is tragically killed. Can you still come to church and lift up holy hands and declare this is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Sometimes God's trying to see how big your faith muscles really is. But maybe, maybe sometimes God allows us to be tested to reveal our faith, but maybe it's also to reinforce the faith of others. Because when you read this story, you notice that Abraham and Isaac, when they got to Moriah, they were not traveling alone. No, some servants, some lads were traveling with them. So when they got to the base of the mountain, Abraham said to the servants, to the lads, hey, you all stay here and watch the donkeys while my boy and I go up in the mountain to worship. And we are coming back. <laughs> That went right past your head. He said, I'm getting ready to go do what God told me to do, but we are coming back. Centuries later, the anonymous writer of the epistle to the Hebrews was able to crawl into Abraham's psyche and tell us what was on Abraham's mind. Hebrews 11 says Abraham had so much faith that he believed that even if he killed a boy, God was able to raise him back up. Can I tell you today, I don't care what's dead in your life. It's not so dead that God can't raise it back up. Now. We are not told whether these servants, these lads, <clears throat> we're not told whether they were privy uh, as to what Abraham's intentionality was. But let me speculate that if they were in the know, uh, the conversation between the servants might have gone something like this. Hey, man, did you hear what he said? He said he's going to go on the mountain to kill the boy. But both of them coming back. Let's see how he's going to pull this off. And can you imagine what it might have done to the faith of the lads when they saw Abraham and Isaac coming back down out of that mountain? Come here, let me tell you something. Whenever you go through a test, it's not just for your benefit. Somewhere some lads and ladettes are looking at you. Go through what you're going through. Some, somebody today, you come to church and, and, and people know. You've told people of your personal testimony that the doctor has found out that you have cancer. And yet you don't come to church holding your head down and feeling sorry for yourself and having a pity party. But you come to church and lift up holy hands and worship God. Somebody that's looking at you saying, now if God can help her to have joy and I I know what she's going through. That same God can help me to have joy in light of the problems I face. If there were ever a case for church attendance, that's one. You all, we, we need to go to church because we draw strength from one another. I draw strength from you and you draw strength from me. And yet some of us now, we act like we don't need to go to church on Sunday. <laughs> Oh, no, church is Sunday is just a day to golf with our friends, you know, and to lie around and whatever. I don't need to go to church, but if anybody ought to be in church, it ought to, especially, not just us, but especially those of us whose skin has been darkened by Mother Nature's son. Because everything that we have acquired in this nation, we have gotten it by the direct or indirect influence of the church. It was the church that pricked the conscience of a racist society and pulled down the walls of segregation. And now we're able, and now, but now that some of us have moved on up to the east side and finally gotten our piece of the pie, we act like we don't need to go to church anymore. Shame on you. Um, but let's, let's, let's not keep you too long. Here's Here's my last question. Here's my last question. We know something about the source. We know something about why. But what, were the, what's, what was the result? What, what were the results of this test? What life lessons did Abraham learn as a result of going through this test? Here it is. First of all, he learned to hold 
what he loved with an open hand. If the devil was the devil then, like he's the devil now, he must have been there. And he must have said to Abraham, hey man, don't be no fool. That's bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. That's your child. Don't you be no fool and listen to God. And he must have been tempted to close his hand around his son and say to God, no, God, not my son. If you want anything else from me, you could have it. If you want my money, you can have it. you want my livestock and, and my wealth, you can have it. But not my son. You know how long I waited on you to have this boy. Not my son. But Abraham's actions, when you read the story, says that he didn't say that. I think his actions said that he says to God, Now, Lord, you know how much I love this boy, Isaac. Lord, you know how long I waited on him? Lord, you know he's the apple of my eye. He's my heart. Lord, you know how much I love my son. But Lord, as, as much as I love my son, Lord, I love you more. So if you want him, here he is. Come here, let me ask you a question. What's your Isaac? What is it in life that you are so in love with that even God can't have it? Hmm. Is it your career? Of has your priority in life, is your priority in life, your career, getting ahead, breaking the glass ceiling of corporate America? Have you become a workaholic to the point you don't have time for God, you don't have time for your family, and you certainly don't have much time to go to church? Is that your Isaac? What's, what's your Isaac? Is, 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 is your Isaac, um, since this is back to school, is it your children? Now, we're supposed to love our children. We love our children. But some people almost worship their children. And they worship them to the point that they won't discipline them. Come on, teachers, and help me out. And they send these undisciplined children to you for you to straighten out. What's your Isaac? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Um, is it your money? Is that, is that your Isaac? Charles Stanley said that money is God's greatest competition in the human heart. You know, every time we are asked to give an offering, uh, we're taking a God test. Oh, yeah. Because when we don't give like we ought to, you do you know what we're saying to God without saying it? No, God, not my money. <laughs> I worked hard for this money. I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps to get this money. Fool, do you not realize that were it not for God, you wouldn't even have any boots to strap up? Now, let me give you the paradox about it all. You have a little moment. You got a minute. Here's the paradox about it all is... That you ought to love Isaac. You ought to want a good job. You ought to love your children. You ought to want to make good money. You ought to love Isaac. But whatever you do, keep your hand open. Because God may come along and say, give me your Isaac. He learned to hold what he loved with open hands. But then lastly, he learned that God is faithful. Let the church say God is faithful. So when they got there, to the, to the bottom of that hill, I can now see a father and son. There they are. Yonder they go. Up the side slope of that hill. There they are. 
Yonder they go. Young Isaac is full of vim, vigor, and vitality. He's excited. There they are. Yonder they go. Isaac, Isaac perhaps is in a talkative and playful mood, but the old man doesn't feel like talking, and he certainly doesn't feel like playing. There's a knot in his very stomach because he's torn between his love for his God and his love for his son. And it was only when they got to the summit of that mountain that young Isaac's sophomoric voice broke the eerie silence and said, wait a minute, Daddy, Daddy, you taught me to worship God. Daddy, you taught me that we are to worship only one God, and that is Yahweh. Daddy, I know the accoutrements of Hebraic worship. He said, Daddy, I see the fire, and I see the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered in verse 8 in his Hebrew dialect. He said, son, don't worry, Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. Come here one more time. Is there anybody in the room that knows God is Jehovah Jireh? Is there anybody in here ever had your back against the wall and you didn't know how you were going to make it, but he showed up and opened the door and made a way? He is Jehovah Jireh. Uh, now, some scholars believe Abraham was about 120, at least 120 years old now, because he had the boy when he was 100. Isaac is in his early 20s. If Isaac had wanted to, he could have resisted his father. And there is absolutely nothing a 120-plus-year-old man could do with a 20-year-old boy. But he didn't resist. Or he could have taken off running. And Abraham would have had as much a chance of catching him as you and I would have a chance to catch Usain Bolt. <laughs> he didn't run. But he allows his father to bind his hands and his feet. We brag about the faith that Abraham had to give the sacrifice. But you ought to give Isaac some credit for the faith he had to be the sacrifice. He bound his son on that altar. He drew, grabbed the dagger, drew it back to slay his son, and when he drew that knife back to slay his son, someone suggested the whole host of heaven was standing on tiptoe expectancy, peeping over the baluster in glory, and the angels were looking at each other saying, I think he's going to do it. I believe he's about to do it too. And just about the time he was about to bring that knife down to kill his son, God dispatched an angel and said, get down there, angel. You should have seen that angel fly quicker than it once, sooner than right now that angel got there on the spot and said, Abraham, Abraham, stay your hand. Abraham, look around you. There's a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And that ram became a substitute that died in the stead of his son. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but let me speculate. I like to think that when Abraham and Isaac were going up one side of the mountain, that ram was coming up the other side of the mountain. When the problem was going up one side, the answer was coming up the other side. And I just stopped to tell you that your answer is on the way. What you've been waiting for is on the way. What you've been trusting for, it's on the way. But wait a minute, wait a minute. As I back away from this text, wait a minute. As I back away and look at it through the lenses of redemptive theology, wait a minute. As I look at it across the Testament into the New Testament, wait a minute. I think I see another hill. Wait a minute. I think I see another son on that hill. Wait a minute. I think I hear another father. Jesus Christ on the cross became our substitute. He died in our stead. Are you glad today that he became your substitute. Glory to God. So I go to my seat and I say to you, yes, life will get rough. Yes, times will be tough. Yes, the problems in the hills will be hard to climb. But I've come to remind you, don't panic. Don't throw in the towel. World ain't coming to an end. 
Because it's only a test. 